Thanks for listening to this message from Fusion. You can find more messages at fusionbc.com. Can we give one more hand clap? Come on, that was such a great job. And he knows God knows how to turn the pain and the suffering in your life into witness, amen? I was teaching at Potter's yesterday. And it's just bringing out how the things that hurt us and wound us, the things that we hide from and don't want nobody to know, when we invite God into those things, he turns the darkness into light. Amen. Amen. He has the power of transformation. The things the enemy meant to destroy you, God means for good and will use them for good. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Turn with me, if you would, in your, book, in your Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 2. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to try to condense this message in order to fit into the time frame that we have left. I, I messaged the worship team this morning and I said, don't hold back, don't cut short. We have extra stuff today, but I'll adjust the message time. And if I don't adjust the message time, we'll adjust lunch time. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Can we just stand for a moment? Can we do that? My heart is so stirred. That drama just moved my heart. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you come to us in our moments of weakness. That you're with us in our times of trouble, in our, in our struggles. God, in our desperate hours and in our greatest hours, it's always because you are there with us. Ministering, moving, strengthening, and showing. And Father, you transform us into a vessel of light, into, into someone that you can use, Father. Someone that can be effective to the world around them. I declare there's nobody here by accident. God has created each and every one of us to be effective in our generation, in our age, in our time, to our friends, our families, to those that we encounter. You are strong in the Lord because you walk in the spirit of His might, by His presence, with His authority, in the name of Jesus Christ. We are empowered to be your children, to be strong, and to be your witness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise before you sit down. And sometimes you just, sometimes you just got to stir it up. Amen. Times you just got to stir it up. Turn with me, um, Mark chapter two. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna read real quick. I'm gonna read verses one through eleven. It says, and again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. Somebody say he's in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, being one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Means four guys were carrying. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of palsy, Son, Thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. But that thou may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose and took up his bed and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it in this fashion. Thank you, Father, for your word. God, we just thank you for the leadership of your Holy Spirit that takes this word, that makes it life to us, that brings revelation and change by it, that equips us through it, Father, that stirs our faith and gives us the anointing of God to break these yokes of bondage in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're just going to back up and we're going to kind of go line by line here. And I'm going to try to take my time and not get in too big a hurry because there's some things I feel like the Lord wants to bring out this morning. But the first thing I want you to recognize, okay, the title of the message is, He is in the house. 
Can you say that with me? He is in the house. Come on, say it again. He is in the house. Slap somebody high five and say he's in the house. Now I want you to understand this is kind of metaphorically speaking because I'm not just talking about the church. Obviously God is in this place. Anytime we gather together and worship and praise Him, the Lord's presence is going to be here. But it's not just this house that I'm talking about. It's your house. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God dwells within you and everywhere you go, you are the house of God. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost and His presence is with you. Can you say amen? Amen. When you're lost, when you're hurting, when you're in need, when there's a struggle and a trial, when there's something to overcome, when there's somebody who needs a a blessing from the Lord or a hand up, I want you to recognize when there's a need, you're the answer. God is in the house. Peter's mother-in-law was healed when Jesus came into their house. Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead when Jesus was in the house. When no one else would, uh, would touch her, the sinful woman with her alabaster box, came into the house where Jesus was, knelt at His feet, broke the box over Him for anointing, and found redemption, grace, and empowerment in the presence of Jesus Christ. Because all things are possible when Jesus is in the house. Can you say amen? There was correction and cleansing in the house of God when Jesus was in the house. Anybody remember Jesus making a whip out of leather? Flipping over some, ch- some, some tables and throwing their money in the floor. There was a cl- there's a cleansing that goes on when God comes into the house. And I don't want you to fear away from that or stray away from that. Because what we need more than anything is for the Lord to come and cleanse this house. What we need more than anything is the purity, the holiness, the, the recognition of the glory of who God is. And the more God comes and cleans out this house, the more He abides within us, the more His power and anointing and glory can flow through us. Raise your hand and say, Lord, come and clean this house. All things are possible when Jesus is in the house. Amen. Mark chapter 2 and verse 2 says, And straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. I wonder if we would listen what God would preach to our hearts today. I love when we were worshiping and Scott said, let's just take a moment. Ask the Lord, what is the Spirit saying to you? I want you to know something. God is always speaking to you. There's not a day, there's not an hour, there's not a moment, there's not a time when God is not speaking to you. Do you understand the Bible says that the thoughts that God has about you, individually you, Every day are as countless as the sands on the seashore. God is always thinking about you. He's always making ways for you. He's always working on your behalf. Even when you can't see it, God is there preparing the way for you. He's always present and He's always speaking to you. I wonder how many words we could get in a day if our heart would just be focused on, I'm going to hear you today. He's here, He's present, and He's speaking. So what are we receiving? When God is in the house. Verse 3 says. And they came unto him bringing one sick of palsy. which Which was carried by four men. And when they could not come nigh unto him. For the press. They uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up. They let down the bed. Wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Sometimes you just got to tear the roof off guys. Sometimes you just got to remove the barriers, whatever it takes. Sometimes you have to be so desperate, you're willing to do things that people don't normally do. You got to be willing to go in places that nobody else will go. When that woman who had an issue of blood all of those years pressed through the crowd, she was supposed to be announcing her ailment. She was supposed to be considered unclean. It was supposed to be illegal and unlawful for her to be touching and in a crowd with people. But she broke what man said in order to get what she knew God was saying in her heart. If I could just touch the hem of his garment, I would be cleansed. These four men whose friends was lame, they knew if they could just get into Jesus, if they could just get in the presence of the Lord, if they could just come under that anointed man, that his, his, his anointing would touch their friend and he would bring healing and there would be deliverance and their love for their friend caused them to do something that was beyond thinking for most people and they tore the roof off of the house. How many knows if I come over and tear the roof off your house, you might be upset at me. They were willing to risk the persecution of others in order to get into His presence. I said a lot right there and I think maybe you missed it. 
What are you willing to do? Can I get some brothers and sisters help me preach this morning? What are you willing to do to get into the presence of God, even if it upturns somebody else's turnip cart? Even if it flips over somebody else's wagon or upsets somebody else's temperament or maybe you make somebody uncomfortable, go ahead and shout a shout of praise anyway. Go ahead and sing a song anyway. Go ahead and declare His name anyway. I don't care if it makes them nervous. You're supposed to make the devils tremble. Let's give a shout of praise for the Lord Jesus right now. Come on. I don't want to get all Pentecostal on you or nothing. But I'm always fascinated how the same denominations that tell you you don't have to shout and you don't have to scream and you, you don't have to get emotional are the same ones that tell you that God doesn't heal anymore. They're the same ones that tell you that God doesn't move anymore and He doesn't speak to you anymore. But yet when you get around people who are somehow convinced that God moves and that He speaks and that He he's anoints and, and that He changes. Those are the same people that will tell you, you know what, you got to stir it up a little bit. Sometimes you just got to shout a shout of praise. Sometimes you just got to fall on your knees in worship. Sometimes you just got to go ahead and cry and weep before the Lord and declare the goodness of His blessing in your life. Amen. What are you willing to do? Are you willing to do whatever it takes? Are you willing to tear the roof off if that's what it takes? You see, the, the roof that we most often have to tear off is not the one on the building. How many knows the roof is always the top? The top of this house is where my intellect abides. The top of this house is where my thinking and considering and, and reasoning all comes into play. Sometimes you've got to just take the roof off. Because the intellect is a great servant, but a terrible master. Because the Lord will go beyond your intellect. He understands far beyond our thinking. Our reasoning only takes us so far. And then there comes a place where faith has to take over. Maybe it doesn't make sense that God would heal me. But His Word declares He heals me. So I'm going to stand and believe His Word anyway. Sometimes you've got to take the limit off of your expectations. I wonder how, how much more of God we would see if we would quit limiting what we think God can do. And you know, the, the, biggest, the, the biggest limitation is never on God. This, this is the trick of the enemy because he's slick and he's sly. The trick, the trick is never about what God can do because you hear people say, you heard me say this last week, people say all the time, well, I know God can, but I don't know if he will for me. So now the enemy knows he can't get you to doubt God, so he gets you to doubt you. He, you're doubting your position. You're doubting your worthiness. You're doubting your effectiveness. And the problem with all that is, is it doesn't make any difference. He didn't come because you were worthy. He didn't come because you were effective. He didn't come because you were mighty. He came because He was mighty. He came because He loves you. He came because He uh, paid the price to pay for your sins so you could be worthy even when you weren't worthy. His blood makes us worthy. And when are we going to get our mind off of us and just on to the Lord and recognize, my God come to heal me because He loves me and He wants to, not because I'm good enough. Not because I have it all down. Not because I know all of those laws and all of those regulations and all of those words. Not because I keep everything correctly. But because He perfected me in His blood by His grace when He died on the cross. And when I've accepted Him as my Lord and Savior and my heart is opened by faith, all things are possible when Jesus is in the house. Amen. It's easy to sit and look. We come to church just to watch and see if something's going to happen. Right? We come into a problem and we start telling everybody else, I need help, I need help, I need help. And we wait on the pastor and we wait on the prophet and we wait on somebody to give us a word and we wait on the intercessor to come and pray and we're always waiting on somebody else to do what he come to do. Amen. When are we going to shoulder the responsibility and recognize if it's not happening, it's just not happening because I'm not looking to him enough. You know, what keeps, you know what keeps people from receiving? I, I hope somebody gets a hold of this this morning. You know the number one thing that keeps people from receiving? All these reasons these ignorant preachers keep telling you why you're not receiving. That's it. You're making it about you and it was never about you. Look at all the people in scriptures that Jesus come to heal and to move and to anoint. And, and all of the times God done these mighty works all through scriptures. Those people weren't perfect. 
Those people weren't even ready. Are you listening to me? Gideon was threshing wheat in the barn. He was hiding in the barn. He said, my house is the lowest in Israel, and I'm the least of my house. In other words, there's nobody in the whole country less than I am. And the angel of the Lord comes to the man hiding in the barn and calls him a mighty man of valor. What did he do to deserve that? Nothing. We are so busy limiting God in our head. Because we think we haven't done enough or know enough or feel enough or get enough or give enough. Or... When are you just going to shut up and realize he's God? And he loves us enough to do it anyway. Can I get an amen? amen. We're always waiting on, on somebody to fix it. You know, waiting on God is not a code word for being lazy, right? I think some people think waiting on God means I'm going to sit here until somebody else does it. I'm going to sit here until God sends somebody else along to fix it. You are the fix. The anointing of God that breaks the yokes of bondage is in you because Jesus dwells in you. I, I don't want you to think, I, I don't mind if you call me. I don't mind praying for you. I don't mind, I don't mind standing with you while you go through things. But I can't stand for you. I can't believe for you. you got to get involved. Amen? Every time there's some great event in Scripture, there's somebody in Scripture doing something new. Moses just climbed up a mountain and saw a burning bush. God gave him a staff. Wow. I, I, I actually wor I worded that right. He already had the staff. God just said, what do you got? He's like, I got a stick. How many of them you got? A Anybody got a stick? Anybody got a stick? Look at y'all look at me like that. One brave guy, one brave lady. I'm like, yeah, I, I got a stick. Nobody else even got a stick, huh? What do you got? Because you see, God will take whatever you have and he'll make it great. You understand that, 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 that Moses' staff become the symbol of God's authority. Right? It became the symbol of God's authority. When he got to the Red Sea, God said, hold your staff out over the water. He holds his staff out over the water. When, he, when, he, when God wanted to turn the water to blood, Moses had to take and, and, and put his staff there by the water. When, when, when the, the, every time God moves, when God wants to, to hold the sun still while they battle, the, he has to hold his staff in his hands and hold his hands up. And Joshua then got to come and hold his hands up because the stick got heavy after a while. Okay. Did you know if your stick gets heavy, God will send somebody to help? It's not about you. All he had was a stick. But God chooses to use the stick in a mighty way. Are you following me? Now today, the symbol of God's authority and power is the name of Jesus. Now you don't even need a stick. All you've got to do is use the name of Jesus. It is our symbol of authority. It is our symbol of power. In the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. In the name of Jesus, mountains shall be removed. Another verse said, the trees shall be rooted up and cast into the sea. Mountains and trees, it doesn't make any difference. The name of Jesus has the same effect. At the name of Jesus, the demons will tremble. Are you following me? At the name of Jesus, there's strength, there's power, and there's anointing. Right? When Moses got to a rock and they were thirsty and in need, he struck the rock with his staff. Did you know when the enemy puts rocks in your way, all you got to do is smite them with the name of Jesus. And watch the walls come crumbling down. And watch God make a way in the wilderness where there seems to be no way. It's all about Jesus. And when Jesus is in the house, when the authority behind his name and his power and his will and his presence is with you, there's nothing that can stop you. Oh, I'm not saying it'll happen instantly. Because God likes to test you a little along the way. God likes to watch you become stronger. He likes to watch you become patient. He likes to watch you become full of faith. I told you last week, Abraham believed God for 25 years, but his faith grew as the 25 years passed. Most people wait three weeks and they say, I guess God ain't going to do it. It's been three weeks. Their faith got weaker in three weeks. He went 25 years encouraging himself in the Lord and his faith got stronger as he went. 
Nothing is impossible when Jesus is in the house. But sometimes we got to be willing to tear the roof off. We got to be willing to to, to do things that sound extreme. We've got to be willing to do things that, that other people will think is crazy. They, they laughed. They laughed Noah to scorn for building a boat for 100 years. It ain't never rained. What are you doing? Well, I don't care if it's ever rained before. I'm going to start building an ark for God because I believe there's a sound of an abundance of rain as God's Spirit is going to begin to minister and pour out to anoint and to change. Can you say amen? amen. <laughs> he worked for years in preparation of what was to come. Our preparation are things like fasting and praying, studying and learning God's Word, standing in faith and believing beyond what our eyes see. Even when it looks like it's not possible, we stand and declare it's already been done. That's faith. I think the problem that we see a lot of times is people trying to have faith when Jesus isn't in the house. You see, we, 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 you can let him build the house or you can build the house, but he's only going to live in the house that he built. That means you can try to formulate your life. You can try to figure out what you want. You can throw all your efforts and all your energies into building what you think things ought to be. That doesn't mean God's going to live in that. You want a life where God dwells? You've got to find the life that Christ has for you. Jesus said, he that lays down his life for my sake shall find it. Are you willing to give up your hopes and your dreams and what you wanted your gifts and callings to be and come and find out what God says His gifts and callings in you are? I find it funny how men often want to rule when Jesus said the Son of Man come to serve. If Jesus come to serve, why don't we think we come to serve? Oh no, you don't understand. I have to, you know, I... Uh, I'm so and so and I, I need this title and I need this position and I need this place and you can't talk to me this way because I'm so and so you're an idiot I come to serve because he was my example and he came to serve and I find that if I come to serve and I take the low listen Jesus said when you go to a dinner to take the lowly seat he said because it's better for them to come and ask you to move up to a place of honor than to come and take the honored seat and be asked to move down the other side of that coin is if you ever take the low seat I promise God will make sure somebody lifts you back up to a place of honor you want honor lower yourself can you say amen you want to see the hand of God move? Quit making it about you. Just make it about Him. When we make it about us, we get all messed up in the head and we take away the very thing of power that is what makes it work, which is Jesus Christ being in the house. The Bible says that since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, but the violent take it by force. It's time that the church of Jesus Christ, the anointed body of Almighty God, learn to get violent in the spirit. Learn that their faith has a force that will overcome every arm of the enemy. That learn that the power of prayer will defeat every adversary that the enemy sends against the church of Jesus Christ. If we would learn that by fasting and by prayer and by faith and believing in Jesus Christ, when we call upon his name, that demons will flee from us. That we will cast them out. That sickness shall be healed. That woundedness shall be bound up. That liberty shall come to all of those that we come in preach to when we learn to be violent in the spirit instead of violent in the flesh most of the church is too busy being violent with each other about their doctrine instead of being violent against the enemy in the name of Jesus Christ it's time the church rises up can you say amen, amen. pastor I don't know what that means what do you mean be violent I don't even know if I like the word violent because I was always taught that the word violent was a bad thing you don't, I don't even know if we should be talking about violence in church you better understand what the word violent means Anybody ever open a gallon of milk in Belize? How many knows you had to get violent? Yeah. <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen? How many know sometimes to fix a car, you've got to get violent? That boat don't want to come off. You've got to make it come off. Are you following me? I got violent with my shirt this morning. It didn't like what the iron was doing. <laughs> you 
you're forcing it to happen against its will. That's violence. Did you know that the enemy has a will? The enemy has a plan. The enemy has tactics that he's using on you. And for you to be victorious, you've got to learn how to be violent in the spirit. And there's nothing more violent in the kingdom of God than the name of Jesus. Amen. Nothing more violent than the name of Jesus. Somebody should write that down. In Jesus' name, we fight for our victory. In Jesus' name, we tear the roof off of our limitations. In Jesus' name, we die to ourselves so that God can have his way in our life. That's violent. Number two, they couldn't reach him, but their faith could. The house was so packed, there wasn't even room to get in the door. How many knows that sometimes we don't feel like we can reach Sometimes you're going through things and you don't feel like your prayers are working. Sometimes you're going through things and you just don't feel God. Anybody, am I talking to anybody? Amen. Sometimes you don't feel like you can reach Him. Right? But faith will always reach Him. Because faith will lead you to do what's beyond normal. Faith will lead you into things that are effective. Faith will cause you to take your enemies up on top of a mountain to an altar place and call down fire from heaven. Faith will cause you to speak to a sea and watch it open up before you. Faith will cause you to look a giant in the eye with no sword in your hand and say, this day God will put your head in my hands and I'm going to use your sword to do it, big guy. Are you listening to me? Faith will cause you to do things that seem crazy to others. But you find in the midst of the craziness, there's an anointing of God that makes the impossible work. Religion is by definition man's way of approaching God. You have all kinds of man's ways to approach God from Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, I just went blank. It's all kinds of religions, all kinds of ways that man say that you approach God. If you can't reach him, it's often because your religion is holding you back. I'm just going to do that. Sit there for a second. When we can't reach him, it's often because our religion is what's holding us back. We come with all these rules and regulations, all these formulas and all these methods, and sometimes your methods aren't working. You know why? Because they're not God's methods, they're your methods. Some man taught you the five reasons why you have to be holy to receive from God. I can show you a whole book full of people who weren't very holy till after they received from God. We come up with all these re religious regulations and rituals. In fact, the Israelites added over 600 rules and, t and traditions to what God had given them. 600. God's word isn't enough. Let's add a few more. And 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 then it got so bad that they made all those rules and regulations even more important than what God had originally told them. We do the same thing today. We start talking about receiving from God and you have 10 people and you're going, yeah, but. And then they give you all of their 600 reasons why you've got to fulfill all of these things before you can get God to do. Well, you've got to say his name just right. Oh, no, you've got you to use it in the right language. Can't use Jesus anymore. It doesn't matter how many times I've seen miracles happen at the name of Jesus. Now I can't use Jesus. I've got to call him by a Hebrew name. All of a sudden, God's deaf unless you speak Hebrew. <laughs> I'm just using that as an example. It ain't any worse than all the rest of them. Right? Like, you know, Jesus, the name of Jesus isn't the easy button. Jesus. Jesus. Yes, I hit her. I lost off to her. <laughs> In the name of Jesus. Boom, there's a miracle. In the name of... Do you, most people don't even know what the name of Jesus means. They think it's a rubber stamp that you put on the end of a sentence like a period to get it to work. And that's not true. It's not true. Because I say, be fat and ugly in the name of Jesus. Oh, wait, nothing happened. You. You understand for it to be in the name of Jesus, it has to be Jesus' will 
and I have to be on, op operating under his authority. That's how I use his name. It's not a rubber stamp. It's I'm out here doing what he sent me to do. So when I come across somebody with the devil and I say, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out. It's his authority because he told me to go in all the world and cast out devils. I'm operating in his authority and in his will. That's how I'm using his name. Lord, I just want that brand new Cadillac in Jesus' name. Oh, look, no Cadillac. I wonder why. <laughs> because that's you, not him. Are you following me? Lord, I want to be healthy and wealthy and wise. And God says, you ain't got what it takes, boy. Because it's not about you being healthy, wealthy, and wise. It's about you falling in love with him and letting his will all of a sudden permeate your heart and your mind. And Romans says he gives you both to will and to do. He first puts it in your heart, the desire and will to do it. And then he gives you the steps. He orders the steps of a good man as you walk it out. And you find yourself walking right into the very promised land God gave you the passion and the desire for. That's how you operate in his name. Not just because I saw another preacher do it. Hello? I was, I was in a church here a little while ago. Gonna love it. I was in a church here a little while ago, and this, somebody gave a, 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 a message in tongues, and somebody else started interpreting. And I'm sitting there beside my son, and this lady is going, and thus the Lord would say, and thus the Lord would say, and all these things that the Lord was supposedly saying. And then, and then she says, and you are my sheep. Yeah, sometimes the sheep are stupid. And I looked at my son and said, did God just call sheep stupid? <laughs> My son's like, no. At, at 12, he knew more than the lady talking. <laughs> How are you going to know his will if you don't know him? Are you listening to me? Unless he lives in this house, unless he dwells here, unless, unless it's him that I'm longing after and following after and giving myself to, if I'm not going to give myself to him, how am I going to know his will? Oh, but if I just fall in love with you, he makes himself so, so relevant in every situation. He makes himself evident in every moment. He begins, he begins to reveal himself to you day by day, faith by faith, step by step, grace upon grace. You begin to understand who he is. You begin to know him. You begin to recognize his voice. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Right? In the end... Most of these Hebrews couldn't even receive Christ because Christ didn't come in such a way that was limited by their rules. The only ones who could receive him were the ones who were willing to tear the roof off and say maybe he would walk through and pick those ears of corn on the Sabbath and eat them, even though we say you don't do that on the Sabbath. Maybe since it's our traditions, he won't keep our traditions. You know, we can't even receive preachers and, and, and brothers and sisters in Christ if they don't keep our traditions. Well, he don't dress like we do. He can't be a man of God. He got real quiet in here. What's up? Amen. Right? They had to step back from the traditions and take all of the limitations off before they could see Jesus for who he really was. And Jesus said this. He said, man was not made for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man. You understand that man was created on the sixth day. It wasn't until the seventh day that God created the Sabbath. Man came first in God's creation. God didn't create the Sabbath to limit and restrict you. He created the Sabbath because he understood that these, these, these lawless men who are in need of laws need to have a time to spend with their families or their families will fall apart. They need to have a time where they'll honor me and seek me or spiritually they'll wither up and fade away. They need a time of rest and, and, and for their bodies or they'll work seven days a week and they'll die an early death and they'll kill themselves trying to accomplish something because if you take some time over away from trying to accomplish stuff and focus on God, you'll find that life isn't all about accomplishing stuff. It's really about Him. And then you invite Him into the process of accomplishing things and you accomplish much more with God in it. It was meant to liberate you, not enslave you. It was meant for your benefit. And let's be honest. We're the ones that benefit from rest and worship. Not God. It's not like God is in desperate need of your Sabbath. Hello? It's for you. 
and yet they turned it into such slavery that when the disciples were hungry, and then they get mad, you know, they come down and say, hey, hey, the Pharisees are fasting today. John's disciples are fasting today. How come you guys aren't fasting today? How come you have this liberty when we're all sacrificing? Can I tell you something? When God is in the house, expect there to be some favor that other people don't see. Expect there to be some liberty that other people don't see. I love the verse of scripture where, where Paul says they, they snuck in to spy out our liberty unaware. They come and found out we wasn't in bondage and they didn't like it, but we're still free. Hello? What were they free from? They were free from all these traditions. They were free to love and serve and, and, and just give him their whole heart and their whole life and rejoice in being children of God. They were rejoicing to be, not to try to go do. Are you following me? Why do you guys get, how come you get to eat when all the rest of us have to fast? Don't you love legalism? <laughs> I hear people say all the time, that God is limited by you. Anybody ever heard a preacher say that? The only thing limits God is you. Can I argue with that a little bit without offending you? Because I, I really don't agree with that. I, I don't agree that you limit God. You might limit how you receive from God, but I don't think you can limit God. Because when I look at the Bible, I see God showing up all the time in places where they didn't expect Him and doing some amazing things that they didn't know He was going to do, and nobody there deserved it. Can I get an amen? Amen. When Jonah failed, God had a great fish waiting for him. You realize that to have a fish big enough to swallow a human being, right? It's not Jonah and the whale. Whales don't have throats. Hello? It was a great fish big enough to swallow a man, and he stayed there three days. That means at the very moment that they throw him overboard, God had... Years and years before, planned this great fish to be in the right place, at the right time, in the right moment. Because as bad as this fish story sounds, it's a story of retribution. It's a story of restitution. Are you following me? Because when the fish gets done, it spits him up on land exactly where he should have been. Where in the story did Jonah deserve this? Anybody? Anybody? The Bible says that Peter and James are, 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 are fixing their nets. And along comes Jesus and looks at them and says, follow me. And they got up and fought. At what point did Peter deserve to be called by the Messiah to come and be his disciple? Anybody? At, at what point in Moses' life and his doings did he deserve to see the burning bush on top of the mountain and be called to be the liberator of Israel. Nowhere. At what point in time of killing Christians and persecuting the church of Jesus Christ did Paul deserve to be called by Christ for this light to appear and to blind him, to have this supernatural spiritual encounter with God that transforms his whole life and turns him from killing Christians to the greatest uh, uh, apostle that has ever been. At what point did he deserve that? At what point did he earn it? At what point was he even looking for it? No. And I'll never forget the day I stepped out on my front porch and heard the voice of God begin to convict my heart for the sin in my life. Begin to, 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 to so stir and twist and, 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 and enter into the innermost part of my being that there became a hunger and a drive and a desperate need, a recognition. This is, my life has to change. It has to turn around. I need to have Jesus more than anything else. And it drove me to church. And it drove me to an altar. And it drove me to repentance. At what point in time did I deserve that? I didn't. I didn't deserve it and I didn't earn it. But God had a plan for me. And He's got a plan for you. And He's got a desire and a hunger to know you and for you to know Him and to reveal Himself to you and to be your God and for you to be His people and to write His statutes upon your heart and to dwell forevermore in His presence. God is in the house. 
close. I got a bunch more, but verse five says, "When Jesus saw their faith, if I get ready for this, all right, I want to shake your cookies a little bit." There's four men carrying a crippled man on a blanket. And they're so passionate about getting this man to Jesus that they do the unthinkable and rip the roof off and lower him down. I don't even know if I'm the crippled man, if I'm going to be comfortable with this. Can you say amen? Look, look, guys, I don't know if we need to go through all this. Really, I'm all right. Don't tear the man's roof off. What do you do? Somebody's going to call the soldiers. We're all going to jail. I'm crippled already. I don't need to be a crippled man in jail. Seriously, what do you think is going to happen if you stroke up somebody's house and start ripping the roof off? Can you say constables? Hello? What's the number in police for 911? <laughs> <laughs> then they put him on a rope and they lower him down. I'm crippled. I can't move. You're going to lower me down on a rope? Does that sound comfortable to you? Does this sound logical to you? Does this sound normal to you? They're like, okay, we're going to tie you up. We're going to put you down to the roof. You're going to What? <laughs> and so here comes this crippled man dangling on a rope like a fish on a hook. Comes down through the roof. I'm sure there was some flopping. You can you put me on a rope. I'll bet you I'll flop. Comes all flappy down through the roof. Jesus looks and sees what's going on and it says, and he seeing their faith. Not Flappies. <laughs> Their faith. This is why I get so annoyed when you hear these old preachers who pray and people won't be healed and say, well, you didn't have enough faith. Well, they didn't have enough faith. Where's your faith, bro? <laughs> if it's about having enough faith, where's your faith? Because these guys, this guy was healed because of his four friends' faith. When he saw their faith, he said, thy sins are forgiven you. You understand the condition of his illness was the fact that there's sin present in the world and in us. The Bible says if any man says he has no sin, he deceives himself. We all have darkness. We all have sin. The difference is some of us have offered our sin to Jesus and said, cleanse it, Lord, by your blood because I can't. And some of us have declared we're just good enough because we're, we're good people and we do the right thing. One is self-righteous, which stinks in the nostrils of God. And the other one is, is just humility that says, man, I'm a sinner, but Jesus died for me. And I accept the salvation of his blood. You follow me? By the faith of his friends, the Bible says he was healed. Well, what about Jairus when his daughter is dead and he comes to Jesus and Jesus heals her? At what point does the dead girl have enough faith to get up? You see what I mean about formulas? Once we think we got it all figured out, God puts another verse in there that just shakes our minds up. Well, I just because the point isn't about you, and it's not about you, and it's not about your friends, and it's not about whether the preacher's got enough faith. The point is Jesus is Jesus. And if we'll put our faith and our hope and our trust in him, he may not do it the way we expect. He may not do it when we expect, but you can trust he has your best interest, your best heart in mind, and he is going to be good to you. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. I'm closing. I'm out of time. I'm out of time. But I'm not even going to turn to it. But there's a verse of scripture in Revelations. It says, behold. You remember I told you a couple weeks ago when the Bible says behold, it means see this, perceive it. Get a hold of what God is about to say to you. This is important. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will open the door, I will come in and I will sup with him. All the things that happen when you open the door to let Jesus come in the house. Can you say amen? Amen. Your life is forever changed when you let Jesus come into the house. When you, when, when you give up your religious ideologies and just surrender to him. And say, yes, Lord, I believe you. It's amazing what God can do in your heart, in your life, in your family, in your ministries. He's an awesome, amazing, and a wonderful God. And His Holy Spirit wants to speak great and mighty things 
to your life today. He wants to love on you and embrace you. My God is so wonderful. He has the ability to make each and every person feel like the most special child of God in the world. Listen to me, please. If you've never felt like you were the most blessed and wonderful child of God, that He loves you more than any other child, He still has something waiting for you. It's not that He really loves you more than anybody else. He just loves you so much He makes you feel like He loves you more than anybody else. He's that good. Amen? Stand your feet with me. I don't really want to close, but I'm going to close. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody to come and play piano or guitar or something. I'd like to take a moment now. I, I, I know it's, it's 11 o'clock and, and it's time to go, but I don't want to cut. I don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. I feel like the Lord truly is in this place. I feel Him stirring in my heart. And I know that our God is such an amazing, loving God that He wants to bless you in a special way. He wants to pour out that loving embrace to you. I feel, like, I feel like I should say right now to somebody here, the Lord is saying, I've got this. He sees your hurt. He sees your struggle. He sees that thing that you've been believing for and it seems impossible. And really in your mind, you've been wondering, is He going to do it? Is He going to do it? Is it going to happen? I, I, am I wasting my time? I want to tell you, God says, I've got this. Be at peace. I've got this. Lord, we lift up our hearts to you right now. Every battle, every hurt, every struggle, every wound, every need. Lord, we lift it up before you right now. And we declare that our God is in the house. And all things are possible when you are here. Lord, I ask you, by the power of your grace, to begin to minister to every heart in this place. Words of love and affirmation. Words of healing and words of life. Words of power and declarations of glory because you have such great things in store. Holy Spirit, we receive you. We receive your word today that you love us. That we're going to make it. That all things are possible. That nothing is being withheld from us. Not because we deserve it, but because you love us so much you paid to give it to us. Jesus name as we're standing here today I just want to ask if you're here today and you don't know for sure yes I'm born again in your heart you're not sure would you raise your hand and say Lord I want to be sure today I need you more than anything today anybody at all you've, you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you're just hungry for him that's me. That's me, Lord. Yeah. I see those hands. Would you just pray this prayer with me? Say, Father, I receive your grace right now in Jesus' name. I receive your healing virtue of salvation. I give my life to you. I give my all to you. I ask you to come and to rule and reign in me forever. Be the Lord of my life. Be the director of my steps. Take all that I am. I declare I'm yours in Jesus' name. Save me. Change me. Make me what you would have me to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message from Fusion Church. You can listen to more messages online at FusionBZ.com.